for about 20 years or so, you've been the wealthiest man in the world. But because you've given away so much money, recently Jeff Bezos became wealthier. Do you think if you had stayed in college and gotten your college degree, <laughs> I mean, you don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world, is that right? No, I mean, uh, it's a sign that I haven't given the money away fast enough uh, to drop out of the top 10, you know, and the market's been strong. Actually, the market has been strong. Microsoft uh, is up 35% this year. So to what do you attribute that? Uh, the company, you know, is doing super well. Satya Nadal is uh, a great CEO. You know, the whole dream of the importance of software has really come true. The five most valuable companies in the world are these technology companies. Uh, Microsoft, you know, has a good share of that. Uh, I get to spend about a sixth of my time now is over at Microsoft. So recently you said that the biggest mistake you've made professionally <laughs> was that um, Microsoft should have had the Android technology. Why was that the biggest mistake? Well, when you're in a field, you know, we were in the field of doing operating systems for personal computers. We knew the mobile phone would be very uh, popular, and so we were doing what was called Windows Mobile. We missed being the dominant mobile operating system by a very tiny amount. We were distracted during our Iron Trust trial. We didn't assign the best people to do the work. So it's the, the biggest mistake I made in terms of something that was clearly within our skill set. We were clearly the company that, that should have achieved that. Uh, and we didn't. We allowed this Motorola design win and therefore the software momentum to go to Android, and so it became the dominant non-Apple mobile phone operating system globally. But today your market cap is the highest in the world. You're the only company over a trillion dollars, so how much better could you have been? Well, <laughs> market cap is only kind of an indirect thing uh, that in an imperfect way will reflect what the company's doing. Microsoft would be far more valuable if we had won the mobile operating system right. uh, competition. Right. Android is a huge asset for Google. Recently, I had a chance to interview uh, your wife, Melinda, who with you is the co-chair of the foundation that you've set up. I'll talk about that in a moment. And she described how you met. And she said that uh, you approached her in a parking lot and you asked her for a date and you said in three weeks we could have a date. And she said that wasn't spontaneous enough. Um, and then she gave you her number, and then you called her right away and said, how about dinner tonight? Is that spontaneous enough? And is that true, or is that apocryphal? That's close to true. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a dinner that night that got done at about 10, so I called her up and said, okay, let's meet after 10, uh, which apparently that was spontaneous enough. Uh, okay, so it worked out. Yeah, okay. it did. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what you most want to focus on today, which was breakthrough energy and what you're doing in in the climate change area. And everyone, I think, knows that you've set up a foundation. We'll talk about it later. But your two main areas of focus are K-12 education in the United States and healthcare in the uh, least wealthy parts of the world. And recently, you've decided to make another effort, not necessarily through your foundation, but through uh, Breakthrough Energy, to try to do something about climate change. Why are you so worried about climate change? Well, the climate change is a problem that gets worse every year, and yet what you have to do on a global basis is very dramatic in reshaping the uh, entire physical economy uh, that we have. The greatest suffering from climate change will be uh, farmers in poor countries. That is the uh, droughts, the floods, uh, the heat uh, will cause the problems we already have of malnutrition uh, and deprivation to get substantially worse. And so it's a very complex problem, and it's a problem that fits where I see my value added, which is looking at something through the lens of innovation. Not just the R&D part, but the creation of products and the deployment of products. And so helping to educate people about, okay, what, where, what are the sources of these greenhouse gases? And how do you get on a path of innovation 
uh, so that you can get global adoption and actually bring emissions down dramatically. Uh, you know, I have that now as a priority to articulate uh, that along with those, the other two that you but, mentioned. But is that part of your foundation or are you doing this outside your foundation? Okay, the, the part where you mitigate and you help the poor countries with better seeds and better policies, uh, partly through development aid, that is through the foundation, that mitigation part. The part where you invent new ways of making uh, fuels, electricity, cement, steel, meat, that is uh, done directly by me with a lot of investments, including the fund that you mentioned, the so-called Breakthrough Energy Ventures, is a fund that I assembled a group of 22 people uh, to put money into uh, companies that are trying to commercialize uh, okay. the, the breakthroughs. All right, but that's a fund of $1 billion. Right. You put in $250 million. So can $1 billion really make that much of a difference? A billion, uh, it's actually been very catalytic. So far they have 20 investments. Uh, late next year, we'll probably raise another uh, billion to a billion and a half. You know, this is all about innovation, um, broadly defined. You know, we need to make these dramatic changes. And right now, the premium, if you said, okay, you have to make steel with no emissions, that steel would cost you four times what steel does today. Your electric bill would more than double uh, if, if we just take the technology we have today. So, um, Yes, supporting those companies and drawing other investors in. One thing Breakthrough Energy has done is gotten a lot of co-investors. Green investing didn't go very well in the first round. And so it looked like a field that might uh, evaporate to some degree. Because BVs come in and been able to right. bring a depth of understanding to these things, not only have they been able to invest, the first billion will be uh, uh, fully committed within the next year. But we've gotten other investors. So that's gone uh, quite well. And, and the technology, they only invest in companies who have a chance of reducing greenhouse gas emissions okay. by a half a percent, each, each okay. company. Uh, and you know, they've found 20, and I'm sure they'll find another 20. Now, I'm the smallest investor in that fund, I think. So um, am I going to get my money back and make a return? Or um, <laughs> what, would you, what would you say? I'd say it's of the things you invest in, it's probably one of the higher risk things. It is being done on a commercial basis. Uh, you know, we're likely to have a few significant successes. So it's not philanthropic in the sense that you can deduct it, uh, but <laughs> the, the time frame of the returns right. and the riskiness of the returns are fairly high. So we do expect uh, to, to make a profit out of that fund. So why do you think some people do not believe that there is such a thing as climate change? What is propelling them uh, to say there's no climate change? Is it scientific evidence or some other political reason? I won't mention anybody, but there are some people who don't think that there is climate change. Well, you know, they must not have taken enough science courses or something. I, I don't know. It, uh, the climate is a complex issue. Uh, and you know, just understanding how you do the abatement uh, requires a lot of in-depth study. In the United States, it's become somewhat of a partisan issue, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, you know, it might make it harder to achieve the type of agreements we need uh, here, here oh. in the United States. But, you know, we have two problems. We have the people who deny climate, and then we have the people who think it's easy to solve. And we need to help educate both of those groups. All right, on climate change. It used to be called global warming. Why was it changed from global warming to climate change? The, the problems caused by the greenhouse gases is worse than just the average temperature going up. It causes there to be extremes of precipitation, that is, more floods and more droughts. And so people thought just that warming piece, it's too easy to think, hey, two degrees centigrade, big right. deal, I'll uh, you know, turn up my air conditioner. Uh, and so the idea that it's sea level rise, it's heat waves, uh, 
these things are climate change probably is a better term to capture the breadth of problems. But in the history of you know, human civilization, is there any evidence that people will do things that will affect their great-great-grandchildren, but that they won't see the benefit from? In other words, if you try to eliminate carbon in the atmosphere, you can't really do it in your lifetime because the carbon's kind of trapped there. So maybe if we change our policies 100 years from now, there might be a reduction, or 40 years from now, but very rarely do people want to do something that's going to help their great-great-great unborn grandchildren. So how do you motivate people to do something? Well, the United States, actually, of all governments, has been willing to take on very difficult problems like cancer and make gigantic investments, knowing that the real payoff would be many decades down the road. Uh, you know, when that was first being pushed, uh, you know, people were saying, hey, this is important. Climate change is like that, where you've got to take a long-term perspective. And government at its best is when it's taking that long-term perspective and funding the basic R&D and the policies that lead to, to scale deployment. So uh, today, if we do nothing with respect to climate change, will um, the oceans rise up? And if you have uh, oceanfront land, or is it going to be underwater in 20 or 30 years? Not Well, the, uh, the uncertainties in these models are still fairly high. And so, for example, by 2100, the question of whether we have, do we have one meter of sea level rise or do we have two meters of sea level rise? That's within a level of uncertainty. Now, those numbers, as it's been studied more and more, have gone up. It, the, the, before, the IPCC only took the most conservative view, which would have been about a half meter. Now, the understanding is, OK, it's at least a meter uh, right. and significant possibility that it's two meters. Now, a large part of the carbon we have in the atmosphere now is caused by the electricity grid, which is about 25% or so. Exactly. So 24%, um, it comes from agriculture and forestry. Why is that causing such a big increase in carbon? Well, the, that category uh, is a variety of things. When you clear land, you're taking in the carbon that's stored, say, in the trees or plants there, and you're releasing all of that, like burning the land, uh, say, in Indonesia for um, palm oil plantations. Another thing is that uh, cows and other grass-eating species uh, have a digestion system that emits methane. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And so cows alone uh, account for about 6% of global emissions. And so we need to change cows, uh, cows just cows alone. Uh, How are we going to do that? Well, uh, actually, of all the categories, uh, the one that has gone better than I would have expected five years ago is this work to make what's called artificial meat. And so you have people like Impossible or Beyond Meat, both of which uh, I invested in. Do you eat it as well? Or do you like it? That's Absolutely. You, do. Uh, okay. you can go to uh, Burger King and buy the Impossible Burger. All right. Is it healthier for you or just healthier for the atmosphere? It's, it's slightly healthier for you in terms of less cholesterol. It's, of course, dramatic reduction in uh, methane emissions, you know, animal cruelty, manure management, and the pressure that meat consumption puts on land use. You know, the main reason why we need to increase the agricultural output over the rest of this century is not the population increase. It's that as countries get richer, they eat more meat. And meat is a very inefficient way of, of creating calories. And so, so it's super helpful. Now, with respect to um, solar, for example, is solar a, a solution? There are problems? It is part of the solution. If the sun would shine 24 hours a day. It does. Uh, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, then that 25%, uh, you'd have a solution. So wind and solar are very helpful. And the fact that the prices of those have come down quite a bit. But people think, may think that's a total solution to that electric sector. Electricity, unfortunately, has to be reliable. It's got to work during you know, say the 10 day period that Tokyo, uh, who needs 23 gigawatts of electricity, 
has, you'd have no solar and no wind for say 10 day periods. And so the, the need to have base load generation like nuclear are, are others, or to have a miracle in storage so that you can uh, save that energy is very high. The final solution to climate change, when we really get to zero, a lot of things that use hydrocarbons today, like natural gas heating of, of buildings or homes, will shift over to use electricity. So one of the necessary elements is to get electricity to zero. But the electric sector, even in the US, will have to more than double in size because transportation and buildings and industrial applications that have used hydrocarbons directly will shift over to use electricity. Well, on the electric grids, uh, there's been, that's been in the news lately um, with respect to what we might have done in Russia. Um, do you worry that if we have these big electrical grids in the United States, they could be subject to being knocked out by some kind of cyber terrorism? Well, that's even true today. There are things like the internet and the electric grid that modern society is very dependent upon. And so as we grow the electric sector, you know, we'll have to take that uh, very seriously. The U.S. has not built substantial new transmission, even some very obvious projects uh, for a high voltage line that was going to take power out of Oklahoma and take it into Tennessee, even that didn't get built. So there's a real policy problem uh, it, with transmission, which is a necessary piece right. of the eventual uh, zero emission electricity solution. Now you've been an investor in new types of nuclear technology. Um, is that the solution? Nuclear, better nuclear plants? It is for many, many locations a, an important part of the solution to have energy that's available on demand. And today's nuclear plants, unfortunately, uh, their safety characteristics, their costs, just don't make them competitive. So the two that are still being built in the US, that will be fairly expensive electricity. So the third generation of nuclear, which is what's being deployed right now, is way too expensive. The question is, can we create a, a new generation, fourth generation advanced nuclear, whose economics are over twice as good, you know, whose waste is a tenth, whose safety is much better? And the answer is yes, we can, because we haven't done a new generation of nuclear, and we have much better understanding of how to do that. Whether the United States will step up for the pilot plant for the fourth generation is a question. What about fusion? Is that an answer? Fusion uh, is very exciting. Uh, it's very difficult to do. So there's about seven companies that are messing around with fusion. Breakthrough Energies put money into the MIT uh, related one called Commonwealth Fusion Systems. That technologically is very, very difficult. No one has gotten to so-called energy break even where you have to create 10 million uh, degrees of temperature in order for this reaction in the sun, the fusion, to take place. And so to do that economically and get net, net power output is a huge scientific challenge. It definitely should be funded. But unlike fission, that's very straightforward engineering to build that next generation, doesn't require invention. Fusion requires a lot of invention. What about electric cars? Do you think that's a solution? It absolutely, they, if you look at the transport sector. That's about 14% uh, of. Passenger cars with a, about a, another factor of two to three in battery improvement, which is possible, the mainstream for passenger cars uh, can become electric. So you have to make that transition. Uh, you've got to scale it up. You've got to make sure electricity is, is zero emission. But for trucks and planes, uh, there's almost no chance the batteries will be good enough. And so there you'll still need to create liquid fuels, either with electricity or uh, biofuels, uh, some way. Fuels are amazing. You know, the energy density of gasoline is 30 times the energy density of the best battery we can make. And so if you look at like a, a container ship uh, that crosses the ocean, Having your fuel be 30 times less efficient would mean that 90% of the weight you're carrying would be the batteries instead of the cargo. 
And so trucks and planes and boats, electrification is unlikely to work in those cases. So we need ways of making fuels that are, are zero carbon. When you talk to heads of state about this, do they roll their eyes and say, we're happy to meet you, can I have a selfie with you, and so forth? But <laughs> do they really do anything? And what are you trying to get heads of state to do? Well, in the, the um, Paris Climate Conference, one of the things that was missing was a focus on R&D. And uh, so actually, France said, yes, we want that to be, for the first time at a COP, a real uh, issue that gets discussed. And so what was called Mission Innovation, which Prime Minister Modi uh, got to pick that name, that idea of a commitment of over 30 governments to double their energy R&D was a significant milestone that came out of that conference. Uh, in order to get that commitment, uh, I had to make the commitment that there would be breakthrough energy that would take right. things out of those labs and help get them into the marketplace. So there's been some progress. Climate is complicated enough that uh, you, know, you don't want, you want a broad set of people in the government to understand right. uh, the, the complexities. And in terms of the R&D work that needs to be done, unless the US is deeply engaged, it's unlikely to happen because so much of the world's capacity to do that innovation is, is here in the United so States. The United States pulled out, more or less, of the Paris Accord, though not technically so for another year or so. Um, is that of concern to you? And do you think this is gonna hurt the effort to change uh, climate change around the world? Yeah, it's a huge step backwards. Even if you meet all the current commitments in that uh, climate accord, you're still way over two degrees of warming. Right. And most countries are behind the commitments they made. Those commitments were a set of reductions where you would compare your two, 2030 emissions to your 2005 emissions. Right. And there's a little bit of that that's easy. The shift from coal to natural gas, which is a one-time thing, is a lot of that. Uh, and yet, the world is falling short. And so to have people like the United States say, okay, that's, even that's not important, uh, it just shows how daunting this is going to be. There's no way we'll get there without the U.S. coming back in in a, a strong way. You think if you met with President Trump, you could convince him on Paris uh, to maybe get back in, or is that beyond your capabilities to do that? I, I, someone else should do that. Um. <laughs> All right. So let me go back for a moment uh, to the early days. Um, you famously dropped out of Harvard, and uh, you then started your company. But you, I think, said subsequently that actually you thought the computer revolution was occurring or the software re re revolution was occurring, but actually you were wrong. And if you'd stayed at Harvard for another two years or so, it wouldn't have made a big difference. Is that right or not? Yeah, the urgency that I felt that if we didn't get Microsoft going right away that somebody uh, would do a great job building a software company, we won't have a chance. That probably ended up not being true, that I could have waited two or three years and the opportunity to do Microsoft still would be there. But anyway, I felt a sense of urgency. Uh, and you know, it's not like you know, I still get to take courses and learn things um, today, you know, things like the learning company and there's all sorts of right. great books. So it's not like I've missed some part of my education. Right. When you dropped out, your father and mother said, are you sure you know what you want to do? If one of your children dropped out of college to start a company, what would you say? Well, I'd have to say yes, but uh, <laughs> the dropping out is not an irrevocable decision. Uh, right. You know, if you try and start a company that doesn't go well, they always let you go back. Uh, and so if you don't have, you know, kids that you need to uh, support, you know, it's a very low risk thing, particularly in the culture of the United States where trying to start something and, and failing is not a black mark for the rest of your life. So when you were starting Microsoft, there were a lot of other software companies and you were not number one at the beginning. I think there were others who were a little bit further ahead. What was it that enabled you to beat everybody else up in the software business? Was it Bill Gates, was it something else? What was the unique factor that made you the most successful? Yeah, we were actually the first. And, but there were companies, uh, and they were all kind of single product companies, who got ahead of us uh, in terms of sales. Uh, 
you know, by uh, about 1991, uh, we, we did become the largest uh, of all of them. We were an engineering company. We were about how you hire smart people and how you use tools to develop software broadly. We were global, and we weren't about a single product. So like, for example, WordPerfect was a word processor, somebody might remember. Uh, they did so well with that product that their gross sales rivaled ours when we were doing a broad set of products. As soon as graphics interface caught on, which was Windows uh, that became mainstream in 1995, we became far larger than the other right. software companies. Now, subsequently, uh, you know, Google, Apple, uh, Amazon have become, uh, you know, also extremely right. successful. But in the 90s, we were the strongest uh, okay. by far. Now, the largest companies in the world and the United States today are technology companies. Apple, Facebook, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, and so forth. Um, do you worry that there's too much power and too much data in the hands of these technology companies? And are you surprised the government hasn't done something more than they've done today about this? Well, technology's become so central that government has to think, okay, what does that mean about elections? What does it mean about bullying? What does it mean about wiretapping authorities that let you find out uh, what's going on financially or uh, you know, drug money laundering, things like that. So yes, the government needs to get involved. I, for the early years of Microsoft, bragged to people that I didn't have an office in Washington, DC. And eventually I came to regret uh, that statement uh, because it was kind of almost like taunting Washington, DC. Uh, and so now the technology companies, partly because of the lesson of Microsoft, uh, of course, you know, they could have seen that lesson through AT&T or IBM or Kodak or a lot of uh, innovators as well. They're very engaged. There will be more regulation of the tech sector. Things like privacy, I'm sure they'll, and there should be at some point federal regulation that relates to that. The fact that now this is the way people consume media, uh, you know, has really brought it into a realm that, uh, you know, we need to shape it so that the benefits Outweigh, outweigh the okay. negatives. Um, All right, so uh, it's said that, that when Facebook was coming along, you tried to buy Facebook. Um, did you, you regret not paying a higher price to buy it then? Because you could have bought it maybe for a billion or two billion? Uh, no, I mean, uh, we bought a small part of Facebook and that uh, was a, a super successful investment. They, what, what Mark did wasn't within our am, but um, you know, unlike mobile operating system, that absolutely was because of our engineering right. culture. Doing this social networking thing, we weren't destined to be the leader right. in that. Now we, through an acquisition, we have LinkedIn, which for professional communication and networking is in a very strong position and has lots of, uh, of growth opportunity. Now there was a company that was started in Seattle uh, near you, um, uh, a company called uh, Amazon. And uh, they were supposed to be selling books over the internet and then later other things, but then they started a web services cloud business. How did Microsoft miss that business of cloud? And you're now number two in it, but did, were you surprised that you were kind of uh, beaten to that game by a company that wasn't really a software company? Well, the natural companies to do the cloud would have been your classic enterprise vendors, IBM, uh, Oracle, SAP, who really, in terms of the true horizontal cloud, aren't, aren't there at all. It is a surprise, and it's a huge credit to Jeff Bezos and his team, that they got out in front and, with AWS, did the best uh, cloud product. Today, the Microsoft is a strong number two and a huge distance to number three. Uh, and so it's, it is a source of strength for Microsoft. But yes, uh, there are many companies, including Microsoft, who should feel bad that they didn't, they didn't get ahead of Amazon in doing that work. So if you were uh, 20 years old today and you wanted to start a new company, drop out of Harvard, what company or what area would you want to start it in? Well, this is a, a 
great time to be doing innovation because the tools of innovation are so much better. There are lots of things in biology that are very interesting. Uh, there are lots of things in energy that are interesting. Given my background, I would start an AI company that, uh, whose goal would be to uh, teach computers how to read so that they can absorb and understand all the written knowledge of the world. That's an area where AI has yet to make progress, and it will be quite profound when we achieve that goal. So are you worried about the power of AI to disrupt uh, our civilization, to put people out of work, those kind of things? The increased productivity that will come from AI will create dilemmas uh, about what should people do with that extra time. And you've got to consider that a good thing even though it will be an interesting set of adjustments that have to take place. So most people over the last 200 years or so, whoever they, the wealthiest person in the world was, didn't usually work that hard when they got to be 60 or so. They kind of took life easy. You seem to be working pretty hard. What motivates you to still work so hard? Well, I love my work. The work of the foundation is super interesting. I get to meet with the scientists. I get to go out in the field. I do think your habits are sort of set in your 20s and 30s. And by my standards of the 20s, you know, I didn't believe in weekends back then, uh, not to mention vacations. So I'm you know, fairly lazy compared to myself in my 20s, where I was a true uh, fanatic. Uh, you know, all I believed in was working on software night and day. And, and for my 20s, that was perfect. I didn't have a wife or family uh, at all. And my role was very hand, hands-on role. You know, I, I'm very lucky that my foundation work, the part-time work I do for Microsoft, I see that extending you know, for decades into the future. And having an understanding of innovation, uh, you know, I think shaping innovation in many of these areas, uh, there is a unique role that I can, right. I can help play. Okay, so, but being Bill Gates, pretty famous over the last quarter century or so, can you go to a restaurant and people don't bother you? People are pretty nice about that. Uh, right. Particularly if I'm, I'm with my family, people are, are reasonably discreet. So and it's not a problem. You're driving a car, people ever stare at you saying, what is he sure. doing, driving a car? Sure, but okay. that's okay. <laughs> right. And uh, when you, you, your sport now is tennis, right? That's right. So you've played with some of the best players, Roger Federer and others. Um, you get a lot of points off of those players? Or? Not, not if they're playing full out. No, not a chance. Uh, okay. And you've given up golf. That was one of your other sports, so you don't play that? Largely much. given it up. I, I still play a little bit. And what about bridge? Are you still a big bridge player? I, I love playing bridge. It's a, a game that the players are aging uh, quite a bit. It hasn't caught on uh, with Is that good or bad? People. Because you can... No, it's unfortunate uh, because it's a great game. But... Right, so when you want to go buy something, can you go like in a department store and buy anything? Or how do you shop? You shop online or you just go buy anything and you have to use a credit card or cash or what do you do? Yeah, I, you know, for a while I, I didn't do that much, but it's something one of my daughters enjoys doing is helping pick clothes for me. So we go out uh, and go shopping together and, you know, she's got good taste. So it's, it's a, a neat father-daughter activity. One time, uh, your wife told me that when you drop your daughter off in college the first day it's at uh, Stanford, she's graduated from now, um, the roommate didn't know that she was going to be the roommate, and then you needed things to fix up the room, and you went to Lowe's to buy things in Lowe's. Uh, was it unusual for you to go into Lowe's? Did people stare at you? Do you go into Lowe's or Mar Mar Walmart very much or things like that? No, it was actually kind of hard to assemble uh, some of that <laughs> stuff. Uh, you know, I wanted augmented reality to help show me how to put the pieces together properly. But, you know, people are very nice. Uh, you know, overall, so uh, when you're super nice. When you're relaxing today, is it to go on a trip with your family, go someplace you've never been before, go on a boat, play tennis? What is the best way that you relax? Uh, you know, traveling, and then I, I get to do quite a bit of reading. Uh, in that case. Uh, now you read how many books a year? You try to read... Uh, 50. 50 books a year, okay. And do you um, comment on those books and you recommend those books? And Probably 15 a year I do serious reviews of. Um, you know, I mentioned at lunch I'm reading this Jill Lepore of These Truths, right. which is this great uh, history of the United States. But there's, 
so many fantastic books. Well, I have one coming out. Could you review that? I will. Thank I you. will. Okay. All right. It's history book. Okay. Well, let's go back to your foundation. Okay. Uh, I ask people all the time, I say to them, uh, suppose you had the problem of Bill Gates and Melinda Gates. You have $100 billion or whatever it might be. And then you say, okay, I give you $100 billion, and then you go buy a yacht at a plane or a house. Then you've got $99.5 billion left. What do you do with that? And the problem, you had that problem, and you assessed the two most urgent issues were K-12 to in the United States and health in the uh, less developed areas. How did you pick those two? Any regrets about picking those two? And have you made progress on either of those two? Well, global health uh, is our biggest area, and there the progress has been really unbelievable, not just because of our work, but our partners that include the U.S. government spending on PEPFAR, the European donors uh, who've really stepped up on these health issues. One of the metrics of importance is the number of children in the world who die before the age of five. When we got started in the year 2000, that was over 10 million a year. Now it's about five million a year. And so, you know, it's just mind blowing and, the, and people aren't that as aware of it as you'd like them to be. The, those deaths because of getting out vaccines and understanding a bit more about nutrition, those deaths have been cut in half. Now the goal is to cut them in half again uh, by 2030. And it, we do have, you know, the pipeline of new vaccines and, and new tools, particularly in nutrition that give us an opportunity to do that. So our global health work, because of the partnerships we've had, because of the innovation, has been more successful than we expected. Our US education work, uh, that is not just K through 12, it includes uh, higher ed as well, there the key metrics, uh, dropout rates, um, uh, math and verbal achievement, those metrics have moved essentially not at all. And even as the US is spending more resources on education, we spend by far more than any, any country in the world, and yet our results are quite a bit worse uh, than uh, almost all the other rich countries, and even some middle-income countries. Uh, you know, even Vietnam now is passing us in terms of their math uh, results. So the, the, there, the field as a whole and our work has not had the impact we hoped for. Part of what you try to do in the education area is have something called Common Core, and that was very controversial, but now it's largely been adopted? Yeah. So the, in the United States, there were some very strange things. That is, our math textbooks were twice the size of the other countries. In fact, three times the size of uh, Singapore, which has the best math education in the world. And that had come about because of this process where the textbook companies always wanted adoption of new textbooks so they didn't have to compete with the used textbooks. Anyway, they just got thicker and thicker. And so uh, the US would tend to t try to teach too much in a year and instead of really cementing the basic knowledge. And so the idea of the Common Core was to say, what math should you learn in various grades? Make sure that by high school graduation, you have reasonable math skills. Uh, and so it became more rigorous. It matched what the best standards in the US were, which were in Massachusetts. And it meant that all the online material and kids who moved between different school systems, you'd have this alignment. Okay. And you know, it's the world's most logical thing. And yet it was super attacked. You know, as though math in one state is different than math in another state. Uh, but anyway, it's largely okay. succeeded on almost as a subtle thing. So uh, Warren Buffett, can you describe your relationship with him? Um, he is a little bit older than you, and you developed this close relationship. And then ultimately, he gave you a large part of his fortune for your foundation. How did that come about, and were you surprised that he did that? Yes. Um, Warren's 25 years older than I am. Uh, you know, he's absolutely an amazing person, and I was lucky enough to meet him in 1991. I didn't... Reluctantly. Yeah, I didn't think I wanted to meet him because I don't think of buying and selling of stocks as a value-added uh, part of society. Except um, for private equity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, more involved in the innovation 
uh, part. But when I met Warren, the fact that he had this model of how the world worked, you know, he, he asked me, why can't IBM put you out of business? Which is a, a very smart question. Uh, you know, because at the time IBM was 10,000 times our size, uh, and yet, you know, we would go on in terms of software innovation and even value the company to surpass IBM, who was the dominant computer company when I was growing up uh, by you know, well, huge they, amounts. Wouldn't, well, they, their mistake was when you developed the software for their IBM PC, they should have bought it from you as opposed to license it. Is that, that right? That would have helped them, but the, <laughs> the, it wouldn't have really okay. changed things. I mean, well, the, back, okay. what's happened in computing required really thinking about the microprocessor and software in a very different way than they did with the mainframe. It, it really is uh, kind of an innovator's dilemma thing that this very low end way of looking at computing, personal computing, the technologies that came out, out of that now dominate everything, corporate computing, cloud computing. So Warren Buffett, so he, yeah. he developed a relationship with him and he get, became a bridge player with him and I, offer and so yeah. forth. And um, one day he calls you and says, guess what, I've got an extra $100 billion, I don't know what to do with, I'm gonna give it to you. What did you say? Well, it was unbelievable that he chose uh, a substantial part. He created five foundations uh, that, are, that he's uh, giving substantial money to. A high percentage of that went to our foundation that basically doubled uh, our ambition. And so, you know, going after malaria eradication, going after new seeds, we added an agricultural thing, we added sanitation because of the incredible resources he, he didn't made want available. his name on it? Why do, somebody we should... asked him, uh, and he said no. So anyway, Warren is an unbelievable person. I've learned immense amounts from Warren. So today, people come to you all the time for money, I assume. Everywhere you go, people say, by the way, I have this thing you should invest in. I have a couple myself I'll mention later. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, a couple of things you should invest in or things you should give money to. So how do you resist it? You have some person who says no for you, or how do you do that? Let many people. Uh, many people say no. Well, once you've picked what you care about, if somebody has something that can make a difference in global health, we're super interested. And you know, we have a staff of 1,500 people, and if it's to do with global health, some of those people will come out and talk through with you whatever your innovation is and how we can partner with you on that. Okay. You know, so that's clearly in our area. If it is something that can substantially improve K through 12 education, then we're going to be very interested in it. If people are asking outside of those things, then you know, fortunately you can say no because focus is, is key to philanthropy. So people have recognized over the years that raising children is difficult. Jackie Kennedy famously said, uh, if you mess up raising your children, nothing else matters. Uh, you have three children, seem to be well adjusted and you've kept them out of the newspapers and so forth. How did you um, do that? And has that been more of a challenge raising healthy kids with a wealthy background that you have? How do you avoid spoiling kids like that? I think that's a huge problem. Uh, you know, obviously, our kids have benefited from having a great education and an opportunity to travel, and uh, you know, so they're very lucky in that sense. Making sure that the visibility or the way people treat them is not unnatural. There are some challenges that come with that. So far, they've handled it well. You know, Melinda uh, is the one who deserves any, or certainly almost all the credit uh, for the kids so far uh, doing very well. You know, our kids, we've said to them that, that, you know, the money is going to the foundation, and so they don't think of themselves as sort of aristocratic But well, what do they say when you tell them that? They say, can you give me a little bit or something? Or they don't, <laughs> they don't ask for some? They'll get a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, are they gonna be involved in the foundation? No. And uh, the foundation, you have a finite uh, length of the foundation. I think it's, tw is it 20 years or? After the le last of us to go, yep. So why, why not have a perpetual foundation? Well, Warren has influenced my thinking on this quite a bit. The idea, our foundation is aimed at eliminating the diseases that disproportionately affect the poor. To try and make it so no matter where you're born, your chance of survival and living a, a long, healthy life are equal throughout the world. 
That should be achievable. Uh, you know, assume you know, Melinda's going to live another, uh, say, 40 years. That gives us 60 years okay. to solve those problems. <clears throat> That's doable. And we should take all our money and put it against US education and global health. And there will be problems in the future that, at least from my grave, I won't understand very well. And there will be rich people in the future. In fact, more rich people in the future than there are today. So they, they should uh, use their intelligence and understanding to go after those problems. Having a pile of my money left over to go after those problems just doesn't make any sense. How much money has your foundation given away to date? About $40 billion. $40 billion. Yeah, we're now up to giving $6 billion a year. OK, that's pretty good. Um, So do you have any regrets about not having started philanthropy earlier? Because I think you didn't retire from uh, Microsoft full time to you're about 50 or so. Is that right? Yeah. So I, until the year 2000, I had not done significant philanthropy as a percentage of, of my wealth. I'd given you know, a few hundred million dollars. In the year 2000, I put $20 billion into the foundation. And so that's when we got serious. I'd say so, that was. Uh, I was part time uh, on the foundation work from 2000 to 2009, uh, 2008, sorry, when I retired from Microsoft. And then I flipped so that I was full time at the foundation and part time at Microsoft. And that, that's worked out well for me. Uh, you know, some of these issues, yes, I wish, like for an HIV vaccine, we had started sooner because we'd be further along. But anyway, it, it, the timing has worked out well. So do you have any regrets in your life? You seem to have a life that many people would love to live. You've got a happy family, great marriage, foundation, business success. Is there anything, can you make us feel good by saying you've done something that didn't work out or just make us, because all of us feel bad because we look at you and we can't do what you've done. So tell us something that's bad that you've done or you feel inadequate about. Something, it must be something. No, I am super lucky. Uh, you know, they marrying Melinda, uh, the experience at Microsoft, uh, that although it had its ups and downs was uh, phenomenal, uh, the work of the foundation, and... No regrets about anything. I wouldn't try and go back and change anything. I mean, for example, the antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft you know, it was bad for the company. It created a lot of distraction. We would have done a lot of things, including the mobile operating system, better if it hadn't been for that. But in a way, it was a lesson for me. Uh, and, you know, so it, and it probably accelerated my retirement uh, by five or six years, which overall, for me, probably was a, a good thing. Um, you know, I don't think it was a principled right. set of activities, but that's another story. So today, the greatest pleasure of your life is when you're doing what? Is it other than being interviewed by me or something like that? What is the great, <laughs> greatest pleasure of your life? Uh, you know, time with kids, time with scientists, uh, time when I'm reading and things are making sense. Um, you know, going out and seeing the impact of the foundation's work. Uh, meeting with scientists who think we can make breakthroughs to uh, help solve climate. Uh, you know, these are super interesting problems. And, you know, having a broad set of system thinking applied to these problems is going to be necessary uh, to orchestrate the resources and policies behind them. So, you know, I love, I love my work. Um, so do you, your children are not married, I think, is that right? Not yet, no. So when they are, do you look forward to having grandchildren? Absolutely. Would, and you're gonna try to teach them software, or how would you? <laughs> no, I don't think of Microsoft as a dynastic organization. Okay. Uh, so finally, um, if people are watching now and they say, all right, I wanna do something about climate change, but I'm just one person, I don't have the resource that Bill Gates has. What can any average person do to have some impact on climate change in your view? Well, certainly, they, as a consumer, can take things like uh, these new meat products or uh, how they uh, buy electricity, and they can help uh, drive up the scale of the, the green solutions. 
The most important thing at this stage is their political voice. Uh, there's going to be a need to put substantial resources into this effort. And you know, we need, we'll need a bipartisan solution. And to send the right signal to the market, you actually don't, if you just win one year and then it gets repealed, that doesn't help at all. The key is what people see the policies will be over the next 30 years on a consistent basis. And that means it's a much higher bar than just a one-time victory. I should have asked you, you started the Giving Pledge with Melinda and, and uh, Warren Buffett, and we won't have time to go through that, but right now, if you were to convey one message to people about philanthropy, what you would like the average person who's not of your wealth to do on philanthropy, what would you ask the average person to do? Well, it's, the best thing is to pick uh, a couple of causes that you believe in deeply and find organizations that you can get involved in. The social services in local communities, the charter schools in local communities, there's a host of very high impact important local things. You're, the dollars you give to global needs actually will have substantially more impact per dollar uh, because the, you know, if you, you can save a life for $1,000 if you just fund measles vaccination or polio eradication. Those things are, you know, pretty mind-blowing in terms of the difference they can make. But, you know, it's all, philanthropy is not based on picking, you know, comparing every single cause and picking the most impactful. It has to be something that connects with you personally. Even, you know, the climate area, uh, whether it's advocacy or uh, high-risk investing or behavior as a consumer, there's lots that, that people can do uh, that give us, will increase our chance of success. So Bill, I want to thank you for taking time.